Companies like AT&T, who are headquartered in Dallas, so they'll be celebrating over there, and Imperial Tobacco Company. So many people have pointed out that, this, that the bank shouldn't be picking and choosing companies like this at all. Uh, MPC former member David Blanchflower, who was leading the uh, Labour Review into the Bank of England, said this is a mandated fiscal policy. So today there's basically been a kind of cross-party consensus on monetary policy, which is leave it to the Bank of England. But that is changing. More and more people are pointing out the QE causes inequality, and leading economic thinkers like Martin Wolf and Adair Turner are saying we should think about abandoning QE altogether and consider uh, other options such as monetary financing, which is where the, the Bank of England creates money, but it gets spent into the uh, economy through the government. 
similar to people's QE, which we obviously heard a lot about last year. Either way, I think we're long overdue a discussion about the, the, the Bank of England and its relationship with the Treasury and how monetary and fiscal policy can work together. So I'm really excited to bring together this excellent panel. Uh, Helen Goodman is MP for Bishop Auckland. She sits on the Treasury Select Committee. But we're delighted that can, she can join us because she's one of a handful of MPs who's tire tirelessly scrutinised the bank and the banking system since the financial crisis. Paul Mason is a writer, journalist and thinker, and he has been contributing to the debate on democracy and central banks. Francis Kohler is a former banker and uh, economics blogger and has been really talking about the issues with the banking system a lot since the financial crisis and causing a stir on lots of issues. And Zoe Williams is a journalist at The Guardian who's been one of the very few brave journalists who's talked about money creation most recently in the book The Alternative, um, where she talks about ideas that hopefully will be discussed today. So I'd like to hand over to Helen to kick us off. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Um, the Treasury Select Committee uh, sees the government of the Bank of England quite a lot, maybe six times a year, maybe ten times a year. And we get the opportunity to ask him lots of questions. So when I discovered through the work of the New Economics Foundation, which some of you probably know about and belong to, um, that the bank themselves had published work explaining that QE leads to inequality, I was quite struck by this. The bank produced a paper in 2012 which found that the top 5% of the uh, income distribution gained, on average, £185,000 per household from QE. The bottom 50% got nothing. And this was because the effect of the QE had been to inflate the value of the assets which um, they hold. And as you probably know, half the population don't have any net assets. They, they might have debts or they might be sort of managing, you know, even Stephen, but they don't have any real assets, so they can't gain from this. And I thought, well, if the Chancellor Nick Shecker stood up on Budget Day and said, um, I'm going to give the top 5% another £185,000 each, I think even the Tory backbenchers would have a problem. <laughs> that would be uh, a very significant redistribution. So I thought we'd better ask the bank about this when they, the next time they came in. So I asked, oh yeah, that's not the governor, so I need to check. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked. I bet nobody's ever called Jeremy Corbyn that. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked, uh, I, I, asked um, I asked what they thought they would do. And they said, he said, and this I thought this was fantastic, he said he thought that to take account of the distribution effects would be political. So it's not political to give the richest people £185,000, but it is political to take this into account. So I thought, well, maybe there's another way of doing QE that wouldn't have quite su such extreme distribution effects. And so I went over to Frankfurt to see the uh, European Central Bank to find out how they do their QE. And they do do it in a different way because they do buy different assets. And the... the oh, bloody hell, I've got to switch it off. Uh, sorry. Ah. So, um... <laughs> They said they did do it in a different way, and they did it in a different way in a number of respects. First of all, they had a strand of um, purchases for their QE scheme, which went directly into SME finance, which ours doesn't. Then they said that they bought bonds in infrastructure uh, banks. So. We don't really have a successful uh, business investment bank in this country. It's something that John McDonald said he wanted to do uh, from the main conference hall yesterday. And it's something that we've looked at and discussed previously. 
and uh, we did uh, persuade the Tories to set up the Green Investment Bank. So, you know, we have made progress on this in the past. Of course, the Tories are now privatising the Green Investment Bank. Uh, so we don't really have the kind of vehicles that they have in Germany, which is where they have where they have an infrastructure bank called KFW, or France, where they have an infrastructure bank called CADES. But that has enabled the ECB in its queuing to concentrate its um, purchases in things where they are actually going to spend the money in the real economy on things which are useful for improving the productive cap capacity of the economy rather than simply giving house price rises to people in London and the South East, which is what's going on at the moment. The other thing that was very interesting about what the ECB said when I went to talk to them, which is different from the bank, is that they said they were very interested in running the monetary policy in a way that would benefit what they call the periphery. They meant, you know, Southern Europe and so forth. And they said, but you don't really have a periphery. So I said, well, my constituency is in the northeast of England in County Durham, and actually we do have a periphery as well. Um, and this isn't a concern of the Bank of England. So then we had another exchange, and um, I'm not happy with, with, with their responses this summer either. I just want to be clear. I'm not saying that I don't think that the bank were right to take the steps which they took this summer in order to, first of all, calm the markets after the shock of the Brexit vote and introduce uh, 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 some monetary expansion. I'm not saying I'm opposed to that in principle. I'm saying the way they do it is not the best way, it's not the most helpful way. If, for example, they were uh, buying assets in housing associations, that would be providing some money to build some real houses uh, instead of just inflating the value of, of, of homes which belong to people who already have houses, which in fact is just pushing other people further down the ladder. Uh, and they say in a rather airy way when I challenged them on the second occasion, well, there are other, there are other policy tools which you could use to deal with this inequality. Well, I frankly cannot think of a policy tool uh, which we could, uh, in any real political reality, use to take £185,000 off the top 5%. I mean, this is just cloud cuckoo land. We know that we put forward to the British public a mansion tax before the last election, where the average price tag was £3,000, and scorn was poured on us by, you know, all sorts of people. I mean, I think we should go back to that policy. I think it's a really good policy. But, you know, the notion that we can just tweak this or that and undo the damage that they've done with this, I, I think is completely unrealistic. So this brings us to two questions. What would a better economic policy look like? Well, obviously, a better economic policy would include some more uh, expansionary use of fiscal policy. Uh, and we're all hoping that... Phil Hammond, having abandoned George Osborne's fiscal targets, will actually go for some fiscal expansion in the autumn statement in November. But it's a, it's a, it's a, in addition raises the point that you made, which is about uh, control of the Bank of England. I moved an amendment to the Bank of England bill, which went through Parliament earlier this year, to make the uh, Freedom of Information Act apply to the bank. The bank was very resistant to this, the governor was very resistant to this. But actually, I think it's completely reasonable for us to make the Bank of England subject to the Freedom of Information Act, which it is not at the moment. That does not mean that we would be uh, engaging in second guessing in uh, their open market operations in the money markets day to day. We can exclude that. But there is a real problem of accountability at the moment. And I think if we made them subject to the Freedom of Information Act, we would get more openness, and that would be a first really big and useful step forward. Thank you. Thank you.
should I'm good. Are you good? Uh, well, <laughs> thanks for inviting me. And uh, apologies in advance that, that I have to run off halfway through because, like um, everybody, I seem to double boot all my meetings. Um, so I just want to say one other thing as a rider to this. You know, people will know that I am not John McDonald's advisor, as alleged by uh, George Osborne. Uh, things didn't go so well after for George after he misinformed the Commons about that. But um, but I, you know, I do feed in and try to feed into Labour's economic policy. So what I say now is me. It's not them in the sense of. Uh, I, I, could, I would quite like it if some of John's team were here to listen to the ideas that are on this platform. Because I, I do think, if people say to me, what's your economic uh, philosophy? I just describe myself as a monetary Keynesian. And I think that the monetary weapons of a left social democratic government are potentially very important, especially given the situation. Now, I want to start, therefore, not from principle, and I think one of our... One of our discussions here in the Labour conference has to be, especially for those of us on the left, not a constant reiteration of what our principles and theories are, but what we want to do in the next crisis period that, that, is, that, is, that is opening up. So I want to start by describing, I'm only looking at my phone because I've, I've got notes on them, um, describing the situation as I see it. I think the danger of a, of a secular stagnation is real. I, I, think, I am not in the school of Robert Gordon that says it's because the technological productivity miracle has run out. Far from it. I believe that, that technology is creating uh, new business models and new uh, economic flows in which there is no value. That, that you know, a credit system is based on returns from investment based on the growth of the market sector, which then pays back the debt. Um, I think the fundamental problem in the world is that information to technology makes a lot of things cheap or free. Um, and that leads me to worry about secular stagnation as a kind of, in, it, rather in the way that Larry Summers worries about it, that, that is that if we have become over-reliant on monetary stimulus to keep the economy going. You know that, that combined, you know, Japan is the, it, Japan's been through two uh, periods of, of slump and stagnation and is the world leader at QE at the moment and indeed a, a certain kind of QE that I want to talk about. Um, but we have 12 trillion worth of 12 trillion dollars worth of, of, of QE money flowing through the global economy, and it's produced nine trillion dollars of largely government debt that is negative yielding. And as one bond market participant said to me, I came into my job to run a capitalist economy, not Goss plan, you know, not the Russian planning system, because a nine trillion dollars worth of negative yielding debt is a minus sign on capitalism. So. The danger of stagnation was well realised at the March G20, uh, where Carney spoke, and where, if you want to look it up, uh, Claudio, Claudio Borio, uh, who's the head of, uh, of policy at the Bank for International Settlements, issued an equally uh, stark warning to the one that Carney gave, and that is, monetary policy, in the way it's been done, is clearly running out of road. It's creating negative yields, it's creating disincentives to invest, and at worst, it could create what we all fear from the 1930s. That is, once countries realize that a negative sum game has been created, in which what is good for China is also good, in a positive sum game, what is good for China is good for Liverpool. You know, so you open a port in Liverpool because, and you hope that trade in China um, uh, increases. In a negative sum game, everybody has to grab what growth is left in the economy. And one of the ways of doing it is through currency manipulation. And the surefire way to manipulate your currency is to, um, to undermine its value by printing a lot of it. And therefore, what I fear, and what I think was a very clear subtext at the G20, is that what they want to avoid is more, is, is more currency uh, warfare. And so do I. And what they said is, you've got, you've got one more chance. We can do one more radical piece of monetary policy. But after that, it is over to you, the governments, to do structural reform and fiscal policy. Now, I'm in favor of doing a lot of fiscal policy. But I do think here in the UK, we are right to do more and should have done more earlier uh, targeted monetary stimulus. So maybe I'm on a different uh, wing of, of, of the panel than anybody else. Why? Because, because what the G20 uh, and the central banks are saying is that the structural reform has to reignite productivity. I think we have to leave behind neoliberalism. I think we have to re leave behind low wage and stagnant wage jobs. But to reignite the productivity, you're going to need to do things to unblock uh, mechanisms for creating human capital and, and capital itself. 
I would have taken, I would have printed 75, I would have you know, done 75 uh, of QE billion, and I'd, and I've just bought every student loan in the country. Mm. Uh, and I would have buried it in a big uh, dump called student loan dump, in, in which <laughs> there was a 30 year payment, re payment holiday on it, thus removing the line on everybody's paycheck that says student loan repayment. That, in other words, is how you get, how you use QE to buy specific assets to get the money straight into the economy. I'm even in favour of doing it, we have to, helicopter money, but it's not particularly effective. But long term, I think that to finish, what, what I would say we need to think about then is to be overt in what we would need to do to be able to take political control of the monetary policy. It's, I think we have to own up that, that good though it was that Ed Balls and, 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 and Gordon Brown did what they did in 1997, it was the right thing for that economy but then its efficacy ran out, and by the end, I can remember sitting in the Bank of England press conferences thinking, shit, we're all trapped in, you know, in a binary decision. There's a commodities boom, we should be putting the brakes on, and, and all they can do is put the brakes on in a period of commodity uh, boom bust, uh, and yet we put the brakes on as the bank system collapses, then we have to take them off again. What, that's not economic management, it, it's kind of binary decision making. And therefore, I would just, just say, there's nothing reactionary about saying, if, as Keynes said, if the facts change, just change your mind. You've got, we, we have a much more complex world economy, a danger, a clear and present danger of currency manipulation, a negative sum game, and the problem of needing fiscal and monetary policy to interact. So maybe we don't have to do everything through borrowing, so we don't have to do everything through heavy lifting on a Keynesian fiscal uh, level, and if you can do I innovative things, like buying the book, you know, I, I always say, if you can buy 10 billion of VW uh, bonds, you can buy 60 billion of student loan bonds, or you could buy every Everybody's mortgage. This is what, effectively what the Fed did in, in 2009-10. So <coughs> think about that as, an, as, as a philosophy, you know, not rocket science and also not too, uh, not too heretical because we build on Blair, on brown balls rather than scrap it. another event. I'm going to take a couple of rounds of questions from the audience for, for their, what they've come to and then we'll move on to it. Okay, so, mm -hmm. maybe with the glasses? We'll just take three questions and then we'll, so one, two, and then three down here. Yeah. Can everyone hear? Yeah. So we'll just take brief comments from all the panellists on those three. So QE from bottom up, 
helicopter money no good if it even if it boosts demand and the interest question? We've spoken to one of you. No, Paul can go first. He can do. I mean, we live but because because I am going to go in a minute. I will. I'm sorry because I, I want to wait okay. to hear what you're saying, Francis, but I'm, <laughs> and you, Joe. But, oh, you, know. uh, you do. We know each other. Uh, all right. So. Uh, I only want to focus on, on, on the helicopter money thing because I think your question is an interesting one and your one I think basically I agree with you and we've just got to we've got to design once you free yourself from the binary decision making because you know the bank has to justify the binary decision making simply on what will the, uh, the what's the likelihood of hitting two percent interest in three years time mm -hmm. it's like being a goalie and saying if I kick rather than roll the ball out of my hand what is the likelihood of my team scoring <laughs> uh, you know once they've kicked it they don't then they, they wouldn't have to care what the team did with the money so all we're looking for is ways of, of having microeconomic effect which brings me to the thing about about helicopter money if we have to do it let's do it in, in a crisis but remember what it does is it's not my Microeconomically changing anything. It simply says that if you've got ten grand and you've got uh, if you if you've got a job in a, a, a low wage job where you know you're earning twelve grand and you get ten grand put into your account, you, you you're you're all right for a year. Um, but if we did it via things like student loans, through mortgages, through company loans, through infrastructure loans, in other words, if we kick down the walls between fiscal and monetary policy, which is what it does anyway, then you can microeconomically target it for the effect which we want, which is what the BIS and G20 are calling out for, which is structural reform of the actual economy. Um, do I want to go? Yeah, do I want to go? And can I, I apologise because like, like my taxi's outside and, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, no. and total apologies for being fly about that. It's just the microphone we need to read. Not, I would be I'm near as the microphone sitting down and I am standing up. So I'm not sure it would help. I'll just try and shout, okay? Will that do? Yes. Right, money finance not guarantee. We have a high proportion of the working age population working at the moment than ever before. I'm not at all sure what a money finance job guarantee would achieve. Um, it seems to me that what we really need to be doing is finding ways of, of actually increasing people's incomes um, so that the work they're doing actually um, gives them a better standard of living. So for my money, um, I would rather have a basic income than a, 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 a money finance shop guarantee. Um, what's wrong with honey money? I think we have to distinguish between two things here. One is short-term stimulus, where we are... Um, you're putting some money into the economy, and I don't think the way you do it quite works right now, and I think there are ways of doing that that would work a lot better, including getting rid of existing debt. So in that respect, I agree with Paul that we could do a lot with, with money financing of uh, existing debt commitments, particularly among students and among lower income people, that would do a lot to raise their, their, their disposable incomes and their spending profiles. And I think that would, do, that would help to, to um, improve demand in the economy hugely. Um, the second is the longer term need for investment in the economy. And there is an opportunity there potentially for um, bank being support for things like a much bigger business, British business bank. But I do think we need to separate the two. There's a short term and a long term issue there. We need to look at them separately. Um, and the third point about QE. Um, hmm. That happens with all forms of interest mo of money creation, whether it is creating a QE or any other sort of QE, in fact, it, any other sort of money creation, in fact, you could argue that QE actually creates money interest free, um, whereas um, conventional forms of money creation don't. Um, you know, we can go into a greater discussion about um, you know, forms of, of debt free creation of money and whether we should go down that route. So I think that's where you're going, isn't it? Uh, I have a huge problem with the interest and I just think it should be con confined to commerce and manufacturing but taken out of the domestic sector. Okay. Um, no, we can have a debate about the role of interest in the economy and, and whether it is reasonable for households that borrow to do so at zero interest, uh, regardless of their level of risk. Mm. I think you know, we might have some issues around that. But yeah, yeah, okay. 
Um, I think that's a much bigger topic than we can cover here, am I right, Frank? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's also an issue, isn't there, about how likely it is that by cutting interest rates again by 0.2%, we're going to see some great boost, and this is going to yeah, change yeah. the decisions by businesses as to whether to invest in another widget-making machine. I mean, it's just incredibly doubtful. Um, I, I think one of the things that was very successful in 1997 was... Uh, separating the bank uh, uh, out mm. because I think what that did was it established credibility for the um, Labour government and basically having that economic credibility gave us a lot of room for manoeuvre so when we're thinking about policies towards the Bank of England we do need to think also about what we do that maintains credibility and that's why I think steps like uh, applying the Freedom of Information Act is kind of a reasonable thing to do. I, I must admit, uh, well, the central bankers themselves are divided on helicopter money at the moment. Uh, and I'm not a monetary economist, so I'm not going to opine on whether that's a good idea or not a good idea. I mean, it probably is in some circumstances and not in others, but I don't know enough to comment on that, which in a way kind of makes the point because what you have central bankers for is to make useful technical judgments and it's our job to give them the right remit. Do we think having 2% inflation target is the right remit or not? Could we say we want them to have a remit which is about inflation and a remit about employment? That seems to me to be a reasonable thing for a government to do, I'm not saying that there can't be anybody in the government who's better at monetary economics than me, obviously there can be, but um, I, just, I just want to just give a slight sort of uh, put up a flag and say we do need to be careful about the uh, signals we give on credibility. That is important because if we suggest things which people who are extremely well informed about this say won't work, then we lose credibility and we undermine ourselves for the investments that we really do want to make. And I need to get to the meeting. <laughs> okay, we're, okay, we're going to take a few more questions. This time we've got to go. Uh, okay, so purple jumper and then glasses and then... So if the, uh, if the price of baked beans, or whatever is in the basket, is increasing uh, more than 2.5% two, two a year, then apparently that's, um, that's inflationary, that's going to demand on my finances, it's going to cause me to make inflationary waves, demand, spiral inflation, disaster for the economy. If um, house prices are going up by 10 15% a year, rents are being increased at 8 or 9% mm -hmm. of inflation, that doesn't even feature. That doesn't even feature in. in that doesn't even feature in the Bank of England's remit. That's a very good point. <laughs> I'll borrow that question next time they come up in front of us. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a very, uh, a, good, a very fair point, and 
I agree with you. In fact, if one looks back over the last six months, the bank has come under far more attack from the radical right than from us. Yeah. The radical right have been highly critical of Carney's interventions on climate change and green stuff, where he's saying, for example, that the oil companies are stashing up on their balance <coughs> sheets reserves of oil and gas, which they will never be able to extract if we're going to meet our climate change objectives. He's been very clear on that and on saying, you know, we need a better accounting system. And the, uh, the, the Tories were just ballistic when he said that Brexit was going to be a shock to the economy. Um, so uh, I feel that the line we should take is kind of more probing, uh, less full frontal, and using other, as you as you did in your question, you know, well, a dead zone says, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I think that's better than saying, you know, we don't at all agree with, with your whole approach. And, and as I said before, if their approach is, is fundamentally wrong, that's because we've given them the wrong terms of reference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's one more question at the back. And then we'll... I'll stand up because it's actually yeah, not working, I don't think. Is it working? I've got a loud voice anyway. And, 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 as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, politicians are, are greedy. And do you agree, therefore, with me that if they were in charge of creating money, of printing money, and they had free license, that we would end up? in the Weimar uh, Republic in the 20s, in the way, hyperinflation and such like. And therefore, the best way of dealing with this sort of thing is to leave it to the central bank, leave it to the Monetary Policy Committee to make the decision how much and when money should be created, and then give the money to the politicians. But the politicians have no say whatsoever on how much and when the, uh, the, the new money is created because otherwise we uh, we will just lose to the next election because the politicians believe that there is a stimulus. Uh, okay, well, I mean, that was obviously very much the thinking uh, after the hyperinflation of the 70s and 80s, and very much the thinking that informed the new institutional arrangements for, which were introduced by the Labour government in 1997. To be honest, the danger we have now is this constant stagnation and this lack of growth. So there is always that risk, of course there is always that risk. But just now in the world economy, I think the bigger risk is not being able to get growth going and therefore people are looking more at instruments for kick-starting growth. Okay. We're going to need to bring in Zoe and Francis now, right? So, um, do you want to okay. I mean, feel yeah. free to respond no. to any of those questions, but also... I'm going to respond sort of to that last know. question about the Weimar Republic anyway. Because um, I, I talk about I seem to spend a surprising amount of time talking about the Weimar Republic. Um, <laughs> don't we all? Um, yeah, don't we all? Um, in the spirit of openness, I should say I'm not an economist, as Twitter keeps pointing out. I've never <laughs> taken any kind of economic qualification. Um, but what surprised me, becoming involved at any level in the conversation, is the, low, is the very, very poor level of understanding, which kind of iterates itself in a real aggression. <laughs> so if you say anything at all, you get absolutely heaped with scorn um, by people who themselves don't really understand what they're being scornful of. And you get a huge amount of, you know, there's no magic money tree. And when you say, well, how do you think money is created if not out of thin air? They say, where do you want to live? Zimbabwe. And you say, N no. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm happy here, but I'd be interested too to know whether you, what you think money is made of, and they, and, and they never know. And it's been really fascinating to me, being involved with positive money to the small degree that I am, how, how, lack, how, kind of much, how, how little courage there is around this, how people are really frightened of the issue, they're really frightened to say anything around money because they don't really understand how it's made, and if you do say anything, they're really, really angry. You know, they're really angry with a kind of level of citizenly engagement 
as though the audacity of a citizen in having a view on how money is created is, is you know, completely beyond the pale. Um, and that's what I've really noticed at a positive money event a couple of years ago. There were these two guys who had a positive money group in Greenwich and I, I got talking to them because they had it at the same pub that my uncle has his basketball group and they were about the same age as my uncle and him playing basketball was completely preposterous and I thought they, them taking an interest in, in money creation was completely preposterous, you know. It's like, for God's sake, you guys, you're 67. You're not economists. What are you going to do about it? But actually, the, the point was that if you don't take, if you don't engage with it, then it, it rules you. Um, and there, there is no kind of, if you can't engage on a, on the, at the level of the citizen with how your money is created, then you are very much governed by a small technocratic group. And I think that, I think in Helen's point that, you know, these technical judgments have to be made by the Bank of England is not quite it, actually, because a lot of the points aren't technical points. They are political points dressed up as technical points. And we leave them to experts at our own expense. Um, the, the kind of low, you know, keeping public understanding low and policing the parameters of debate so that only economists are allowed into it is a political act. And the Bank of England has to take that seriously because, you know, if we accept money as a democratic resource, then we have to have a kind of democratic say in its creation. To say politicians are greedy, therefore nobody should be allowed anywhere near money is like saying politicians are greedy, therefore they shouldn't be allowed to decide anything. Now, that might be true, they might be greedy and they might be ill-equipped to decide anything, but if they're not going to decide it, we can't say, well, let Mark Carney decide. You know, we can't say, let Mark Carney decide what the NHS budget should be because politicians are too concerned with the political cycle. You've got to come up with a better solution than, than, than you know, bl blaming politicians for personal faults, which I'm sure are myriad. Um, the, once you kind of accept that money is a, is a democratic resource, then you accept that the creation of debt is a democratic resource, or maybe you accept that first, and then you accept the money second. Whichever way you kind of make this argument pu publicly, if you have a kind of democratic agency over money, then you need to be able to you need to be able to kind of understand that. You need to be able to make the case for it. And I think actually that's the best place to start for the Bank of England. And I suppose I'm kind of working up to the point that I think a kind of really key kind of remit for the Bank of England, which they're not taking seriously at the moment, is for everybody to understand money as a social resource that we all have a stake in and everybody to understand how it's made and everybody to understand who decides how it's made and everybody to feel as though they have a say in that going forward. So I don't think, I mean, I know Andy Haldane does take that very seriously, actually, but I don't think Mark Carney does. I think that, that you know, that it's, it's his point about distributional effects being a political act and his stuff being an apolitical act is really telling. His, everything he does is a political act, but the, the politics he agrees with aren't, aren't politics, and the politics he disagrees with are suddenly political. Um, I think if you were to say, if you were to kind of flip it around and stop trying to engage people at a technical level, of, because there is so much shame around understanding or not understanding, if you were to flip it around and, and describe debt creation as a democratic act simply because it is a hold on the future and the future, without wishing to sound like a Nazi and go back to the Weimar Republic, does belong to us. You know, tomorrow, you can explain to people quite easily that tomorrow belongs to all of us so in, an, in an equal way. Um, then you kind of get to debt creation being a being a democratic resource, and then you get to money as a democratic resource. I think if you come at it from the other end, from the kind of Felix Martin end of like the, the kind of the reality of what money is, people switch off. If you come at it from the debt end, then people do understand that it's something that we all need to decide together. And you know, if a the, that should be the very core of their remit is for everybody to understand that, and they can't model that without kind of showing some humility to what voters want. Hold on. You're going to give your five minutes for oh, okay. either five minutes. responding to questions or comments or just whatever okay. you have to say. Well, I did actually personal notes because I had quite a few things to say, as, <laughs> as ever. <laughs> uh, so people who know me very well will tell you getting shut up is quite difficult. Okay. 
I want to talk quite a bit about um, what we might call mixed messages, because it seems to me that what's happened in the last six years or so is that we've seen the Treasury and Bank of England pulling in the opposite directions a long time. So we've had a Treasury that is hell-bent upon cutting back, getting the deficit under control, and the lot of those cuts have fallen at the bottom end of the income distribution and are continuing to do so. There are cuts at hand that will drive down incomes at the bottom end of the income distribution even more. And um, at the same time, um, as we have a Bank of England that is um, trying to kickstart the economy and get growth going and dishing out, as we've heard uh, from Helen, um, the, improving the value of assets at the top end of the income distribution. The result of this is a widening inequality. Um, whether it's been effective, effective in stimulating the economy, I have serious doubts. And the reason for that is that I actually think that when you've got, on the one hand, part of your government cutting back, consolidating, and encouraging all of us to cut back and save like crazy, at the same time as we've got the another arm of government, which is what the Bank of England is, um, depressing interest rates to make it actually very much less beneficial to save in the hopes of encouraging everybody to spend, strikes me as a fundamentally mixed message. So the first thing I would say, so the first thing I would say is I think that the that the Treasury and the Bank of England actually need to be on the same page. Because historically they have not been. And I want to allude to uh, one of the questions, actually, which is this question about politicians can't be trusted. Mm. Because actually, this is a very important <coughs> point, but where I see it is that we've reached a stage now where the risk is not that politicians will spend too much, yeah. but rather yeah. they will spend too little. Mm. And so, um, if we, uh, so we as, as we've heard, there's been a lot of pushback from the right wing against the Bank of England for its policies. And that has been going on ever since the financial crisis, and not just in the UK. The central banks have been um, vilified, really, for the amount of money that they have created and spent into the economy in an attempt to get things moving. We can argue that they may not have spent that money very effectively. I would say that personally. But that is not the criticism from the right. The criticism from the right is that they shouldn't be spending it at all. And so what the right wants is for there to be a consolidation on both the fiscal and the monetary side. Now, I, I'm sure you can imagine what that would have done and would do now if we applied that now. So, in a way, I'm slightly defending the Bank of England here and indeed central banks generally who have carried an, uh, really carried all the responsibility for, for creating what little recovery, recovery we've had. And it's about time that the fiscal authorities recognise that this deficit mania, oh my goodness, we've got to get the good debt back under control when they've got the lowest interest rates in history, does not make any sort of sense. So first of all, let's get the Bank of England, which is adopting a generally expansionary attitude, and the Treasury on the same page. Um, so um, the, second, the second part of that is actually within the Bank of England itself. And again, this is, again, pushed by the Treasury, and we, again, we have more mixed messages here. That, well, there are two parts of the Bank of England. Um, there is the monetary policy side, and there's also the macroprudential side. The monetary policy side is trying to kick-start growth, improve it, um, get inflation up a little bit to try and get some energy into the economy. That's what it's all about. At the same time, as the macroprudential side is clamping down like crazy on banks um, and imposing... Um, rules on them that make it more difficult for them to lend to small businesses and to lower income households. Macroprudential policies, as they have been enacted so far, benefit those who don't need to borrow. They do not benefit those who do. Um, and again, I feel that the Bank of England itself is not fully, on the, uh, not fully in, in, coherent on this. We need to make a decision about what is more important. Of course we want a safe financial system, of course we don't want banks to be lent, taking ridiculous risks, but it's worth remembering that part of the financial crisis, the risks they were taking, they thought were safe. In my book, properly managed um, uh, lending to um, small businesses and to households that is properly managed is considerably safer than stocking up on safe assets that then blow up in your face. 
Um, so it seems to me that we need to have a general rethink of the responsibilities of the Treasury and the Bank of England, and indeed the two parts of the Bank of England, to ensure that we have a coherent policy, an economic policy, that addresses all parts of the economy equally and doesn't end up fighting um, each other and ending up with nothing, a stagnant economy and stagnant wages and businesses that won't invest and can't grow um, simply because we have not pulled the different parts together and said how on exactly do we want this to work. Thank that, you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a round of three questions now. Uh, one here, I'd love to see a hand from a woman if there is. <laughs> I mean, I know this is, we've managed to get a pretty good, mostly female panel, so some questions from women would be great too. Okay, we'll take uh, the grey waistcoat and then, okay, guys, sorry, here, here with the grey jacket <laughs> and then over there. Hi, my name, my name is Hi, Zuma. Now. Um, I'm taking your mixed message uh, situation stage. Yeah. Uh, it was a good idea to make the bank union independent because it made the Labour Party look good and let this and, and let all these people trust them. However, by doing that, you just lost control of the bank of England. So the sovereign money that we that was always created by the sovereign is now created by the Bank of England. So he's the king without a crown. That's interesting. It's done without um, without scrutiny, without uh, too much scrutiny. You can't uh, Freedom of Information Act, etc. And they don't particularly put the money where. The politicians would like to put. Well, if you can't trust the politicians, change them. Don't give the job away to somebody who you've got no control of. That sounds to me like stupidity. So, should we take the Bank of England back? Should we get our, our, our fiscal and, and uh, monetary policies determined by groups who are closer to the population? I think that was called democracy, but I'm making it uh, why do we give it away and should we get it back? Basically. Thank you. Great. Question. Down here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my, my name is uh, Leo, Leo Schultz. I, I would say, if, if you wanted to come up with a plan that was going to create inequality as rapidly and as aggressively as possibly could be created, the plan you would come up with would be a QE on one side and austerity yeah, yeah. on the other side. Maybe that's, exactly what, that's that, exactly what I'm that, saying. That, that, that would be, exactly um, what I'm saying. That would be your, that would be your plan. Um, I think the whole thing, you have to remember, as I think, I think um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Coppola was um, suggested, uh, monetary Goodness. policy and fiscal policy, uh, excuse the pun, are two sides of the same coin. They have to work to, they have to work together. We talked a lot about monetary policy and very little here about fiscal policy, but really what we should be developing is an economic policy that takes both monetary and fiscal policy uh, together. What we probably should be doing, instead of fiddling around at the edges with monetary policy, whether we were to um, buy student loans instead of corporate bonds or to loan to SMEs instead of buying, um, instead of buying gilts, we probably should reverse the whole policy altogether as a tighter monetary policy and a much looser fiscal policy. Okay. And you don't need to create the money in order to have a looser fiscal policy, and you don't need to borrow it either. The money is there. The money is there in very great quantities. And I'm going to tell you exactly where it is, exactly where it is. The money is sitting in untaxed corporate profits in offshore bank accounts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just give you two, two very quick numbers, two very quick numbers. Okay. The Financial Times, and I'll give you an exact reference to anybody who wants it. The Financial Times, according to the Financial Times, 200 billion pounds worth of untaxed corporate profits goes out of the UK every year. That's 40 billion pounds at a nominal, at a nominal, at a nominal um, rate of taxation. 40 billion relative to the maximum tax, which was going to create 1 billion. The other thing that I'll give you from the Wall Street Journal, and again, I'm very happy to give you an exact reference if you want it. According to the Wall Street Journal, um, companies active in the US are currently in possession of a trillion dollars of untaxed corporate, corporate profits okay. sitting in offshore banking. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much. My name is uh, Councillor Paul Grant, and I'm a politician. Uh, which I thought might be safe to make some of the public dogs and attack today. Um, I, I want to make a couple of points about the what, what I think it's phenomenally important for the Bank of England to realise how unpopular 
wrongly, but the phrase, we bailed out the bankers, has put the residents right away across, well beyond the left, I should say, and it will potentially contaminate some of your capacity to carry out your functions in the future if you don't have underlying public support for it. And I think that's part for two reasons. First of all, QE has actually been used to deal with three separate issues yeah. over time, and we've never properly explained it. First of all, when the credit crunch happened in 2008, it was used as a method of ensuring there was liquidity in the banking system. And actually, that really was kind of keeping the banks afloat. Uh, although I try and remind people that was in order to stop their savings and we were being liquidated. So actually, we were, we were bailing out depositors, not banks. But nonetheless, then it shifted towards inflating um, demand, aggregate demand. And I'd say, for the best of reasons, I can see why it was going the way it was. But it was spectacularly unsuccessful because the corporate bonds that were bought didn't generate increased productivity because they were worried about aggregate demand in the economy. And they weren't going to produce and invest. They didn't think there was a demand for it out there. And then gradually now we got to the point where you're looking at your inflation target, so it probably is back to increasing aggregate demand. Which then comes back to the point about is the mechanism that's being used for QE the right way to increase aggregate demand? Because if you're just going to inflate um, balance sheets but not give them the reason to, to produce and therefore to employ more people and therefore push up wages and aggregate productivity in the economy, you're, not, you're going to end up just having the same asset bubble in the corporate sector or the corporate bond sector that we've experienced and you'll continue to lose overall support. So although it seems counterintuitive because I've actually got myself sort of on the sensible wing of the party, the whole idea of helicopter money does actually feel like it is the least or the most egalitarian way of trying to increase demand. Now I suspect there are political reasons why we can't do that but it's almost unsellable. But can I ask you and your policy box to think up a way of trying to increase aggregate demand that has precisely a, 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 a positive redistributive effect rather than a negative redistributive effect? Because if you don't, you'll find that your the public will no longer continue to support what you're doing. And even if the Labour government comes in the future, we will be unable to support a continuation of the policy of QE, even if necessary at the time. Thank you. Okay. So three big questions. Basically, should the Bank of England no longer be independent? Uh, QE and austerity, two sides of the uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy, two sides of the same coin, and issues with corporations sitting on loads of cash. And basically, QE is not popular. What does Labour need to do? Mm. What do they need to promote? Can we just promote helicopter money? What are the issues? Uh, Who wants to go first? I'm, go I'm going to do independence of the Bank okay. of England. I mean, I, this, this conversation happens a lot in, in the energy in the energy world. They kind of we should have, should we have an independent energy commission because actually politicians what they're spectacularly bad at, and I don't think they are all bent. I think it's amazingly uncorrupt British politics. It's like pathetically uncorrupt. They'll do anything for like a job at G4S afterwards. You don't have to get a money. You don't have an envelope full of money. Um, but I think the, you know, they, what they're really bad at is making decisions of more than five years hence. So anything that you need a 15-year cycle or a 25-year cycle or a 50-year cycle for, they're useless at. And, that, and, and that's why, and sometimes it does sound like a really good idea to have an independent energy commission that, that operates like the Bank of England, only for energy, and thinks if we want, if we want to be 100% renewable in 50 years, what do we need to do this year to get there? Um, and that, I do, I, I do have my doubts about whether any politician of any political party will be able to make those decisions. I just have my doubts. So I think if you, if you apply that then to the Bank of England, how, many of the, how long time are the decisions? How important are the decisions that they're making for the next 10 years and the next 15 years? If, if we are looking at very long cycles, I think they do need to be independent, even though that does bring problems with it. But obviously, you know, that... They can then be given a remit by politicians who are elected. I don't, I don't agree that technocrats make good decisions de facto because they're impartial. I don't think there's any such thing as impartiality. Um, but I think any, any sphere in which you need a long lens, you need to consider that unshackling of the immediate democracy with the kind of long technocratic thing. That actually brings me to the QE point. 
which is that if you are talking about how to kind of pump money into the economy while not while kind of not having these negative distributional effects, you need to be you need to invest in something that we will need. It's just absolutely ridiculous. You know, we've known this since the New Deal. If you want to put money into an economy and have an effect on there's no point putting money into an economy if you don't then govern what effect that money is going to have. So I'm not in favour of um, helicopter money particularly. I am in favour of a Green New Deal of you know, to, with the long term aim of becoming self sufficient in terms of energy. So you invest in huge renewable projects distri distributed where they're where they're reasonably productive across the country and then you do a lot about kind of regional disparities and you do a lot about kind of long term energy planning, which I think is going to be our main challenge. I don't think it's very complicated. I don't think it I don't think I, I don't think it will be hard. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, oh. I agree. Over to me, should the Bank of England be independent? Um, it's very interesting what you mean by independence, because the Bank of England actually isn't this kind of totally segregated institution that nobody has any control over. It's not like the ECB, which is independent in that way. And interestingly, the ECB, because it is independent in that way, is completely hedged around with treaties and directives that seriously limit what it can do, and it actually has much less freedom of movement than the Bank of England has, um, which is an interesting perspective on things, but in practice that's what happens, is if you don't, if you have a completely independent Bank of England, you end up at a central bank, you fence it in, um, so it can't blow the place up. Um, should it, so what we actually have here is what we call operation independence, which means that the um, Bank of England has freedom of decision over operational decisions, and that includes things like QE. However, um, it, for example, for the recent round of QE that it's just embarked on, it would have had to get um, agreement from the Treasury for that, because the Treasury indemnifies it for any losses arising from QE. And it can't embark on a QE program without that indemnity in place. So it has to have Treasury permission to do it. The same was true with funding for lending. I don't think people fully understand that independence in the UK, of the independence of the central bank, doesn't mean quite what you think it means. It just means that the Monetary Policy Committee have freedom of decision. But it does not mean that they're completely cut off from government or from the Treasury. And, and my plea is actually for a closer working relationship. There's also a very close working relationship between the Bank of England and the Debt Management Office as well, which is the arm of government that issues government debt. Because, of course, most of, of the decisions that the Bank of England makes involve some, in some way involve messing around with government debt. So there is this incredibly close working relationship and you know that arguably needs to be a bit close as well. It, these pieces of the puzzle need to be more closely joined I think. Um, I don't know that I would want to water down the operational independence. I don't think we need the Treasurer, the, the Chancellor breathing down the Monetary Policy Committee's neck. Um, but I do think they could work more closely together and cooperate better. Great, right, thank you. Um, I think it's a, it's a lovely description you do. And I personally have been shocked by your answer. Um, yesterday, at another meeting, I suggested to the meeting that we should have a Tory dictionary. So when you have words like devolution, which means you're getting the crumbs from the cake, and other words like uh, Brexit. And then you say, see Brexit. Well, independence in this case would be another definition which would, uh, you can do anything you like on diabetes. <laughs> uh, so, if anybody would like to contribute to the Tory directory, I'd be delighted to hear it. It sounds like quite, quite a fun project. Uh, four letters, though. Fantastic, yeah. you don't have anything more to say. If I, if I may, I just. I'm very sorry. Have you got to go? Okay. <laughs> oh, We're sure losing them like flies. This is like, this is like, this, this is We're about to wrap up. Are we on the sinking ship? Francis knows literally everything, so hey. she can hold this on <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we do have some more questions, so I'm quite uh, happy to hang around if you want to. Okay, we've there. got like five minutes left, so yeah, might as well so take them. If I can pick up a couple more, if we come on, I know there's some questions out there, but if I can just pick up a couple more points that people made about this, this Thank question you. of... Of tighter monetary and looser fiscal policy is a very interesting one, and one that's being discussed, actually, about whether we've actually got this hugely wrong. Because the way we've tried to go about things so far is to use loose monetary policy to offset tight fiscal policy. Um, and my take on it is that it doesn't work. 
I am also of the opinion that tight monetary and loose fiscal policy doesn't work either, for exactly the same reason. They have to complement each other, and that means that if you're going to do loose, you do loose, and if you're going to be tight, you do tight, and you justify, and the Treasury and the, and the um, Central Bank work together, not against each other. Um, Is it alright if we wrap, wrap up there? Because I feel like there's actually like plenty of food and people can hang around and absolutely can we can have a discussion, discussion over yeah. food and drink because i feel like you know this is possibly the first time in a while we've actually brought a conversation on monetary policy into the into the labor party and i heard somebody say that they feel like it is a bit of a blind spot to have like a really open and um an uninterrupted discussion on monetary policy and what we think about the Bank of England. And Positive Money is really here to foster this debate. We don't say we've got all the answers. There's a lot of new ideas, quite radical ones, coming out around what we should do with monetary policy, what we should do with the Bank of England. And clearly there's a lot of intelligence and interest in this. Just the people in the room, you obviously know a lot. Um, so we've had a really exciting discussion. We've heard from Helen Goodman about QE's effect on inequality and how important credibility is for Labour Party monetary policy. Paul was quite outspoken and he feels like actually the Labour Party should be talking about a targeted monetary stimulus. He talked about a student loan dump. Uh, Zoe talked about how we need to accept money as a democratic resource and it's a social resource and then have a really open and inclusive conversation. And Francis pointed out very clearly how the bank and treasury are pulling in opposite directions and have been for a long time, but we need to change that if we're ever going to have a chance of having a macroeconomic policy that works. Um, so I just want to finish by saying thank you for coming and thanking our panellists, most of which have gone. Um, <laughs> myself and Francis and other very interested people are going to be here until 2pm. I can see there's still loads of cake left, yeah. so I'd really invite you to join us to continue our, the discussion. So if you just want to thank yourselves and the panellists, and thanks for coming. <laughs>